Tom Monahan is a name synonymous with the global phenomenon of pizza delivery, best known as the founder of Domino's Pizza. Born in 1937 in Ann Harbor, Michigan, Monahan's journey into the pizza world began in 1960 when he and his brother James purchased a small pizzeria called Dominic's in Ypsilanti, Michigan. With a vision that was both bold and innovative, Tom bought out his brother's share for a Volkswagen Beetle and renamed the business Domino's Pizza in 1965. Under Monahan's leadership, Domino's revolutionized the pizza delivery industry. His introduction of the 30 minutes or less delivery guarantee marked a pivotal moment in fast food history, setting a new standard for convenience and service. By the time he sold his company in 1998, Domino's had grown into a multinational giant with thousands of locations across the globe. Monahan's influence extends beyond the realm of pizza. A devout Catholic, he has dedicated much of his fortune to philanthropic efforts, including Catholic education and the founding of Ave Maria University in Ave Maria, Florida. His legacy is a testament to entrepreneurial spirit, vision, and the impact of innovative service models on global food culture. Casualty, I looked inside the dragon's eyes and then I told him casually, Hi, I'm a dragon slayer and I got a dragon lair. I'ma go to slay a dragon, then I'm gonna drag it there. I don't care, I ain't scared. Look inside my heart and there's a line there. Conquering my dragons, I ain't fighting fair. Well, it is great to be with you. Uh, you've influenced me before we even knew each other for many years because I was kind of coming into my own in the 80s when I was uh, in business school. And today, people might, you know, turn on the TV or open a, a magazine and, and read about Elon Musk. But in the 1980s, it, it was Tom Monahan everywhere. And I remember that. It was Lee Iacocca, too. It was Lee Iacocca, too. Yeah, yeah there's no the doubt about it. The two of us. Yeah. And so, but other than what we heard in your introduction, what would you like the audience just to hear uh, to kind of set the stage here? Uh, nothing comes to mind. All right. Well, you said, by the way, that your easiest interview ever was Howard Cosell. I'm no Howard Cosell, so that's probably not going to work out the same. But what I wanted to get into is, you know, there's a lot of people who they want to know, how do you get into what you get into? You know, they sit around and one of the things that Nikola hears me say all the time is they're, they're sitting around at one o'clock in the morning with a bag of chips and a beer watching Shark Tank saying, that was my idea. I, I, I thought of that. Um, but they don't do anything. How did you go from the humble beginnings that you had to being in the pizza business? Did you sit around as a five-year-old saying, I'm going to be a pizza icon and then I'm going to own a pro team? How did, what, what were the steps that got you there? Well, I was brought up uh, very poor, of course. Mm -hmm. On the, on the, on the in foster homes so, uh, through my elementary and high school years. And um, on my own, uh, as an 18 year old, supporting myself. And, um, and I was always a uh, forest kid in the class. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I was in Northern Michigan where everybody was white. Yeah. Uh, and uh, tread bearing blows, embarrassed. And I, I think I, I saw what other people were wearing, kind of cars, or family group. Well, I didn't even have a family during when I was doing so. Mm -hmm. I figured when I. Uh, uh, that was a big dreamer. And, and I uh, get on my own. I can control my own life. I'm going to make something of it. Yeah. I can't wait for that to happen. Yeah. So I I was always, uh, big ideas just came natural to me. So you, you and by the way, there's so many in-between questions too that are so useful for people, especially because families are broken down so much, you know, and you didn't have a family for tragic reasons. And of course you, you yet were, you had this like maturity of a person who would have had a father that formed them incredibly well. Where, how did you develop these, these virtues that led you into what you were doing? Did you know that Leading Giants has over 120 micro learning modules from four to 19 minutes on entrepreneurship, communication, anything to maximize your influence? We are here to help you build the life of your dreams by maximizing your influence, growing a company, leading people at levels you've never led before. If you're in sales, having a greater opportunity for increased closing percentages and larger activity than you've ever had before. It's time now for you to jump in and join Leading Giants. All I have to do is press that button right down there. In order to access this, share with your friends, become a giant. We'll go slay some dragons. Well, I have my faith in only our floats. Uh, we had a little now. I entered in the first and second grade. 
and she was my mother, my father, my teacher. Yeah. And she uh, encouraged me, and uh, uh, and uh, well, I thrived under that encouragement. And uh, I remember um, they asked the kids in the class, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" I said, "Well, I'll be play shortstop for the Tigers, be an architect, and and to be a priest." The kids laughed, and the sister said, "Well, you know, Tommy, yeah." Um, and no one's ever done that before. You really want to do it. To, the reason why you can't do it. That's kind of encouraged. Well, I wanted to be a priest at the time. I was in the second grade. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in the art that everything was was about God and about religion. Maps every day, benediction every day, uh, long morning and evening prayers every day. And everywhere you look, there's uh, picture, religious pictures and on the walls and statues and uh, just uh, or just uh, enveloped by it. Lonely. The forming of virtue is really an intense thing. That's one of the things we talk about on the program a lot of times. You, if you don't have those virtues, you're just behind the eight ball right from the beginning. Um, but to have a nun like that, what was her name? Sister Branda. Okay. For her to be able to form you that way is really incredible. So did you, did you, I noticed in that list, you wanted to be a priest. Mm-hmm. You wanted to be a starting shortstop. For the Tigers. For the Tigers. Okay. But you didn't. You didn't want to be a pizza icon at the time. How did you find yourself doing that? <laughs> well, that was uh, quite a bit later. Uh, once I got out on my own, I I worked. I saved my money. I drove a truck, uh, delivered magazines and newspapers until I got some side things going. And I decided that I'd better go to school. Well, I didn't crack a book from the time I got kicked out of seminary in the tenth grade, so I I barely graduated. So I didn't figure I could get into any school. So I. Uh, Applied to a school, a uh, new school, it just became a state school. I got accepted, and I went there for one quarter. I got a good enough mark to transfer to Michigan, mm-hmm. and, uh, but I didn't have the money to go to Michigan. It was a little more expensive, $90 a semester for tuition. Wow. <laughs> That's a little <laughs> that different was, now. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and so I uh, uh, I needed a job to make at least $2 an hour to accumulate any money for that summer of 56. So I hitchhiked to Chicago looking for something because I couldn't find anything around the end of Detroit. And, uh, and I wasn't doing any good there either. So I was walking by a post office in, uh, in Harvey, Illinois, suburb of Chicago, and I saw the recruiting sign in there. And I had seen ads showing that if you join the Army, uh, they pay for your college education. So I figured, well, let's uh, look into that. So I went in there, talked to the recruiter, and, and I said, is that true if I join the Army? We, will pay for my college. He says, that's true. If you join for two years, you get uh, three years, you get two years of college all paid for. Mm-hmm. So I, I signed up. And now this is, I think, if I remember correctly from talking to you before, that you didn't know, you thought you were signing up for the Army, but it didn't end up that way. That's right. Yeah, the guy never let on that he was a Marine. He just went along with me. So they sent me down to the federal building where they do all the processing. I had a hearing problem. I never... I didn't have to worry about getting drafted, mm-hmm. but I didn't tell them, and they didn't check. And, wow. uh, and so I, I got in. They were signing the papers, and there was all kinds of recruits in the federal building that day yeah. going through the process. And I saw the, a globe and anchor down the corner of the, of the page I was filling in, and I thought, That's not, that looks like a Marine Corps. And so I asked the guy next to me, is this the Army or the Marine Corps? He says, Marine Corps, you did <laughs> So I figured, well, what's the difference? Then we get three years of college all paid for and so I signed it, and then the next thing you know, they tell everybody to turn around and raise their hand and face the flag, and, and I was a Marine. Wow. And, of course, you know, being raised in the, the orphanage and being taught the faith and having that kind of disciplined, I would imagine that you were pretty well ready for the Marines in a certain sense, even though in other sense nobody probably is. Is that right? That's true. I uh, From the institutional I had brought up the institution, so I, mm. I uh, even the seminary institution, I was in there for one year. And um, so I was used to that part of it. But, uh, but what I didn't like, and uh, well, I was pretty indignant about was every other word was a four-letter word. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I just didn't talk that way. When there were all people that did, and I said, I can't respect these people. I can't call this guy sir the way he talks. And I said, I want out. And they mm-hmm. laughed at me. So, wow. <laughs> uh, and I had the second highest uh, GCT in my outfit, and they put me in the infantry. 
Wow. Where's my, where's my education? Yeah. Well, it's the best education I could have ever had. Wow. And so you had a lot that you had to kind of just get past on a personal level there. Uh, you were continuing to form great habits and the discipline that you would need to do the things that you did afterwards. And something you carried with you is the ability to do 100 push-ups until just last year when you hurt your shoulder, right? Well, I've... Um... Well, the, the, once in a while I have an injury that I, that I have to cut back, yeah. but uh, I build back on it. And you've never stopped? No. And I, how old you Twice know? a week. Twice a week. Um, I'm uh, be 87 in March. 87 to 100 push-ups. I love that, by the way. Mm-hmm. So, okay, so um, so now you, you get out of the military, and what a lot of people say is that— Well, what, uh, there was a little story there, too. I okay. I saved most of the money I made in the Marine Corps, sale of them. Mm-hmm. And— uh, for college, and um, uh, and I did everything I could to prepare myself for life when I got out. I read a lot. I worked out uh, every chance I got. Uh, and I, I, I checked out more books in the library there. How often put together? I went to the big library. Yeah. Um. And so um, well, just before I got out, I had about two thousand saved up. It's more than half the money I made in three years. And uh, it's like back to the base and was home and picks me up. And make a long story short, I ended up giving him all my savings. Um, well, he was a kind man. Really? And what, what was what was his how did what was his deceit? Well, he was an oil man, and uh, he gave me he was fast talker. Yeah, Irishman. Yeah, and he, <laughs> he uh, John Patrick Ryan, and he um, uh, told me about all this to the police and allowance and all this stuff, and he he just trolled a dry hole, but uh, even dry holes. Uh, uh, Make money because uh, See, they, uh, you, you sell. Uh, I've heard that's most of the work. Well, and, uh, so, yeah. And so, so you lose everything after all that hard work. And so, a lot of people say they say you need to follow your passion. And for me personally, I I can kind of see that and kind of not. I mean, I have never really been in a business in particular where it's like. I mean, I just think about the people in the doorknob business. None of them were sitting around playing in the backyard saying, oh, you want to be an astronaut? You want to be an athlete? I want to be a doorknob executive. Mm -hmm. But you can still get that very same thing that you want out of those other things. And pretty much anything you do, as long as it's morally neutral or positive, did you have a passion for pizza or did you have a passion for organizing, building, and growing, and that was your tool to get there? My main uh, uh, experience in the food business, I was a... I was a soda jerk. Okay. And I just, you know, one of those guys that got good hands, uh, quick, and uh, and I, I put on a show. Long yeah. counter, rolled them down the counter. People would come in and just watch me flip those sodas out on the Sundays. And uh, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. I was good at it. And, uh, and uh, so uh, I got in the pizza business. Uh, uh, it was real. And, well, in no time, we're the busiest pizzeria, first in the state, then eventually in the country. And uh, well, we just had to make pizzas fast. Mm. And that was probably the fastest pizza maker in the world, partly because we were so busy and it had to be, and partly I had a, I had a good hands. Yeah. And, um, and everybody tried to be faster than me. And they, and they... Speed, speed was a theme for you. Oh, yeah, we had to handle the rush. My whole theme in my 38 years in Donald's was handle the rush. Because uh, if you get behind in the rush, uh, you, know, you lose all your customers. Pizzas are cold. They're, Is that how the 30-minute delivery yeah, thing that came was, to mind? You know, that was right from the beginning. Then eventually the 30-minute guarantee. Yeah. Um, but uh, I would say that, uh, well, that was a fanatic. I worked seven days a week in that first tour. We were, all, we were not open during the day. And uh, most days... People will eat pizza during the day. It was, a, it was a nighttime thing. Yeah. And um, uh, we were doing uh, about 6,000 pizzas a week. There may be a store somewhere in the world that does that. But, uh, but for reference, what would a normal store do? In the pizzas a week, I would say, uh, well, let's say it's about uh, $10 average, and they do about a million dollars. Wow. So you were... Yeah, you were exceedingly beyond what they were doing. And this is just with the one store? Well, I had, I had other stores, but the one store was the main one. That was the main one. Mm-hmm. Okay, so at what point 
do you take? So here's what a lot of our entrepreneurial listeners want to know and where they get stuck. And I see this all the time. And I know you have seen it more than I have, but I'll have somebody that says, I really want to go big. I want to do something more. They're kind of a solopreneur. They're a photographer or, and they left their job and now they take pictures themselves or they're a plumber. And now they're doing all the plumbing themselves with one truck, no help. They're stuck or, you know, executives, coaches, whatever, recruiters. Yeah. And I always try to explain to them that if you're going to grow an organization, your responsibilities need to diminish, but your responsibility will go up and you have to, you have to now see what you're doing times 10 and then times a hundred and then times a thousand. If you really want it to go, if you do this same thing every day, you're going to be trapped. And it is amazing how many people just, they can't let go but you saw Domino's as something times way more. You were telling me one time how many stores you were opening up every week or month or year at its peak. What was that? It was three a day, but it was uh, 954 was our top year in 1985. But uh, after that first store uh, going well, it was legendary. Um, and um, it just uh, basically all in all, we just have a big oven and the uh, and, uh, a lot of household involved training the people. And, um, and I was uh, starting to, it didn't take me long to go to the library and get a list of all the uh, schools in the country with large touring capacities, a little reference library. And because that's where our business was, in the dorms. Yeah. And, uh, and so I was, uh, there was about 200 stores with a sizable dorm capacity. And then I discovered military bases. They were even better. And there was about 100 military bases. Uh, so that's where I went. Um, and so the thing that the, 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 the mystery to a lot of people is there were a lot of pizza shops, but there was one guy saying, how do I duplicate this to the universities? How do I, wh where else do I find something? Now I find military bases. What is it in your mind that said, if I can do this here, why can't I do it everywhere? Yeah. Well, you say a lot of pizza shops in those days, the Big segments of the country didn't know what pizza was. Okay. Uh, it was in the big cities in the east. And uh, if you met somebody in the south, you say you're a pizza bill, they don't know what you're talking about. Wow. Then, uh, but our, our thing was delivery. Mm. It was the hardest part of the business. And uh, the pizza places that deliver did it just to get some by them until they can, their table business, inside business, build up, and then they get rid of the delivery just like that. Yeah. And my thing, I, I just fell in love with delivery. The challenge of it, the handling, the rush, the peak periods were so intense. Uh, this took a, a lot of logistics, pre-rush planning, scheduling, uh, training. Uh, I just, uh, as a store manager, that was probably the best I ever felt in my life before or since about being, doing just exactly what I was born to do. I, was, I felt I was good at it. When I came into the store and turned on that sign, I was just like the boxer in the ring. And I didn't sit down until the end of the night. Yeah. That, what I love about what you just said there, and this is, this is like so powerful for you, young people that are doing well now or entrepreneurs that want to make a break. This drives me crazy. If you, if you go online, LinkedIn, all these social media places, everyone teaches somebody how to be a coach. They go, they go, I'm going to coach you how to coach other people so that you can get millions of followers and make millions of dollars coaching people to be coaches, to be coaches. They don't want to do any work. They just want to tell everybody what to do. And it's like, I call it like the online Ponzi scheme. It's, it's an amazing thing. And most of the resumes include having no history of actually building anything, but they just want to be advice givers. But you came right at the heart of it and you said, you know what I liked about it? That challenge. I liked how hard it was. Delivery was hard. And I knew I could solve that problem. Being attracted to things that are difficult is only something you can have because of the virtues that you had formed. Well, I knew if, uh, if, uh, if I could handle that, and no one else could, uh, that I'm going to be all right. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, I was, and to do it, I just streamlined the operation. And I got rid of all the other items on the menu. I got rid of the tables. And I just focused on delivery, free delivery. Yeah. And, that's uh, that's really incredible. And no other item is just pizza and coke. So you're highly efficient. You drop everything. You're focused on one thing, deliveries. You're carving a path that's really changing the way Americans ate in many different ways. How long does it take before somebody says, this Tom Monahan has a great idea. 
I want to steal it and compete. And what was that like? Well, you had a lot of people uh, that uh, tried to do it because it didn't cost much to open a store. A couple of used ovens and a mm. little refrigeration and you're in business. Uh, oh, boy, you have to get a mixer. Uh, but uh, so you could get in business for $5,000. My second store cost $2,200 to open up. Uh, of course, I had to mix the dough by hand in my. I couldn't ask anyone else to do that because it was so hard. Wow. Uh, so I got a mixer. But um, uh, so a lot of, it was easy to get into it, but it wasn't easy to. Uh, to master it. Uh, the rush. Yeah. Did you think much about competition? Did you give it any thought? Did you just run your own race? How'd you look at it? Uh, well, basically all the competition in there. Um, there wasn't anybody doing the YM number two. Yeah. And. Uh, in, in, in any of our campus stores. Um, we opened Ann Arbor, and we opened Michigan State. And they were probably the three busiest pizzerias of the in the world. Um, we didn't do as well in the neighborhood stores uh, because you just didn't have um, the same kind of, uh, first of all, the market and, um, and the... Uh, Ability to oversee them because it's that's why I really had to go to franchise. And I, uh, um, I start franchising a few of my non campus stores, and all of a sudden they took off when the owner was struggling. And they uh, ended up being that the uh, residential stores are better than the campus stores, yeah, uh, because the campus stores did a big volume for about six or seven months, and then you're dead. And uh, when the average order is smaller, the tips are nothing. Um, and so, and, and you have to build a new customer base every school year. Mm. And, and, and they'll attract to all kinds of competition. Yeah. There's a residential store, you get the tips off and just growing every year and every year and every year. So, that key thing of having that owner, like that, like kind of law of subsidiarity, that was, that was good for you. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, and then we had to do uh, things that uh, made delivery work. We, not only cut out all the things I talked about, we we took all the preparation work out of the store, making dough, slice and cheese, or well, pepperoni and stuff, and put it in the central kitchen. Then we shipped to the stores every day, the dough patties and, the, and all the other ingredients. So the store got concentrated in front of the house, handling the rest. First one to do that. Um, and, um, so that was important. And on the franchise, and we had to come up with a way to... Uh, uh, we could we, it wouldn't work with absentee owners. We had to have people that owner operators in the stores, and we couldn't uh, bring them from the outside and train them. So we finally said, "Well, we're just going to uh, sp- sponsor our own people. Somebody who runs a store successfully for a year as a manager, we'll put them in the millers. Now we like to he gets a bonus, so we like to save some of his money, and uh, and that's how we." Uh, and there was no initial franchise fee. Uh, uh, like everyone else would get that. The initial franchise fee was proving themselves in the store that mm-hmm. they got sauce on their veins. Oh, yeah. And then uh, and they, they grew, and then they sponsored other people, and it's almost like a pyramid. Yeah, that's amazing. Every single one of those principles applies equally today. I mean, greater efficiencies, more more delegation, subsidiarity, empowering people to do things that you were doing once yourself now. They're doing it times, you know, 10 times 100 times 1,000. So one of the things that I love about your story, too, is your dream of playing shortstop never really manifests, but you found a vicarious way to live that out, and it's a pretty cool one. So how many people uh, go from an orphanage to building this incredible empire to becoming a billionaire and saying, hmm, <laughs> What fun can I do with that? So walk us a little bit through the Detroit Tigers and when, and what happened there. Well, um, it, it was not easy. The owner was 83 years old, thought he was going to live forever. Been on the Tigers for, what, 40, 50 years. And, uh, and he's hard to get to. And I managed to get through through probably Bo Chimbecker, a friend of mine. He was a friend of our the Tiger president, and he got me to the owner. And so I had a, uh, a meeting with him in the suite at spring training in Lakeland. Well, that we had it off over there the whole day. He was like me. He was a pioneer in radio. And he grew up a Tiger fan. And uh, 
and uh, had everything I tell him about my background. And, uh, he'd have another story on uh, about his. So by the end of the day, and he had said, you know, I'm not going to sell the Tigers. I, this is my life. I, I picked the last two commissioners and much player to me than the broadcast. So we were leaving. He says, well, I really enjoyed myself. But if I ever sell the Tigers, I'll sell them to you. Hey there, Giant. Dave Duran here, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our brand new e-newsletter where you will get the best of the best tips and insights to unlock the Giant in you, build an empire, and slay some dragons. Sign up below. Let's go slay some dragons. So you made an inroad that nobody else had made, even at that point. Yeah, he thought I was a son of another life. I said, yeah. <laughs> it was, he was born. His birthday was the same day as mine. He was 48. He was... 84, the day I was 48. Oh, wow. <laughs> he thought that was he was into this outer world stuff. Yeah. And so, uh, I mean, it really is interesting how, like, a personal relationship, like, you, you get somebody to like you, you've improved your odds. And that's what took place. So, so this, on this day, he doesn't say, write a check, I'll sell it. But what happens? How does it? Well, he does say, when I sell the Tigers, I'll sell them to you. Yeah. And I say, well, Mr. Vesper, if you sell me the Tigers, well, he was an old pen, penny pitching German. I said, uh, Mr. Petz, if you sell me the Tigers, you name the price, I'll pay it. I'll take a risk. I knew I was going to pay more than any franchise in history, but uh, this isn't a dollar and cents thing. Yeah, there's, uh, a, there's a love. Yeah, and the highest price ever paid for, it's hard to believe, tell you, I think it was about $32 million. And this is 1980? Yeah, 1983. In 1983, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so I figured I'm going to pay 80, 35 dollars 40 well, about six months later, the client asked me, and uh, I'm in my attorney's office, he tried, you want to uh, come down and talk about what we talked about at Spring Drain? And I said, yes, sir. I went down there, and he threw a price on me at $54 million. Okay, so like previously, any franchise of any kind oh, yeah. is like 30 some million, and he throws $54 million at you. <laughs> and that's the day when baseball franchises were probably three or four or five times as much as a football franchise. Yeah, so okay, so for, for scale, for perspective, you could have bought a football franchise for ten million at the time. Probably. Yeah. Um, okay. And 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 he says fifty. Not a chance to buy the Pistons uh, for I think it was four million. Wow. It was wow. Seventies. Like Unbelievable. Okay. So so now you find your you 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 buy the Tigers, and I like meet Sparky uh, for the first time. Our manager. Yes. And I and I I said Sparky when I was. Kids growing up in the orphanage, I used to play shortstop on the team. And I, I, I always dreamed that when I grew up, I played shortstop for the Detroit Tigers. Sparky says, I love my mother, but she didn't do the pitch for me. <laughs> so, so here you are, not uh, not being the shortstop, but employing the shortstop. That's a pretty good <laughs> second option. Uh, and my favorite player was, okay. was Helen Drama. Okay, and your favorite player. Now, there's a couple other parts of the story that I love. First of all, you didn't just buy a franchise and just be okay with it. You bought a franchise and you basically did what you did with Domino's. You took it all the way. So tell us about that year. Well, uh, it was, Sparky said when he uh, became the manager, he's going to win the World Series in five years. I bought the team after his fourth year. All right, there you go. Good <laughs> time. Good year, the period year before. And, uh, and uh, I remember he had me in his uh, office at spring training before they were heading north. He said, Tom, I, uh, I want to tell you, you got, I want you to enjoy owning this team. But, uh, I'm, I guarantee you, I'm going to lose 50 games this year. <laughs> he says this to you. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so we ended up, I think we won the first nine games. Okay. And, and then we lost a game. I think it was a close game. Then we won seven more. 16 and one. Wow. And, then, and how many games this season at the time? 162. Okay. And we were uh, um, 35 and 5. That's still the fastest start in the history of baseball. Wow. Then we went to Seattle, and we, and we were the nothing team. We got swept. Wow. So forgive my ignorance on Detroit history, but was there a World Series uh, championship from the previous owner or during his history? Uh, yes, 1968. Okay, so it wasn't like he, he's saying, wow, did I sell this at the wrong time? <laughs> he already experienced that uh, and, and and probably. And I always gave him the credit. You know, I said, I yeah. just got here. He set the table. I was always 
Oh, he's so appreciative that he sold it to me too. Yeah, that's gracious. He's so, a wonderful man. So you did. So you. <laughs> so this is something else that I loved about it. There, you wanted to meet all the all the guys who were your heroes when you were a kid, watching them. Yeah. And what did you do there? You you arranged something that was new to Major League Baseball. I started a uh, alumni association, former players. Yes. And uh, it became the busiest of all in baseball. We, they did softball games, golf tournaments, and it was. Uh, and they really appreciated it because a lot of them weren't making any money. Yeah. Um, it was the first time they were asked to do anything. They were scattered all over the country, mm-hmm. paid for them to come in. And so they, that was fun. The people that, uh, Chico Fernandez, you know, shortstop when I was a kid, uh, uh, um, well, um, Barty McCoskey, uh, um, um, Walt Tropo, and Art Holliman, uh, Virgil Trucks. These are all big all heroes today. Yeah. yeah. And that was just a thrill for me. That's really awesome. You know, I'm thinking about it. Uh, there's many different things that you can do with your wealth uh, when you when you have it. Buying your favorite team and then being able to socialize with all the people that were your your, your sports heroes, that's a pretty cool way to do it. Now, you... Th- Probably more f- to me than anyone else. Because most people, they buy a team. It's not a team they are brought up with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, now this was a team that was, you know, I lived and died with them every game for my whole life. Yeah, yeah. And every year, the Knights of Columbus would take us down to Brigham Stadium, uh, and that was the highlight of the year for us, uh, see the Tiger game. That's incredible. So so now, you know, you've got a lot of things going on. You're building your pizza empire. You own a professional team. How long did you hang on to them? Uh, nine years. Nine years. So you sold them in 80, 92. Okay, you sold them in 92. Now, um, you you would have to edit this if if I'm wrong, but that's not the biggest part of your story. All of that is what is leading you to the biggest part of your story, and and that's kind of where we sit now. You you had done all these things, but for a greater cause, and you're motivated by things that are way beyond a private plane and a big house. They are things that are eternal. So tell us more about where that led you and why we sit where we sit here today. Well, when uh, things finally, uh, it was all at once. I mean, I thought I was ready to handle success. I went to Mass every day, said three rosaries every day, and, and practiced my faith. And, um, but uh, um, I, I uh, next thing you know, I'm spending water like, more like water. I, a lot of planes, the yachts, um, uh, Pick Lodge on Drumming Island in Northern Lakes here. Um, uh, I was named one of the top hundred art collectors in the country. I had the largest Frank Lloyd Wright collection in the world. Uh, I had the, one of the largest car collections in the world. I broke records one after the other. For and by the way, any, we're talking about bigger things here, but any of those stand out? What What was your favorite? Well, uh, the uh, the Pagatti Royale was eight point one million dollars. Wow, that broke the record. I, I, I was first one to pay a million dollars for a car. That was a Duesenberg. Well, the first one to pay a million dollars for a car at auction, and that was a Duesenberg. Um, I had about two hundred and forty some cars. Wow. Um, so I was all uh, uh, traveling all over the world. Um, uh, all has to be on a lot of boards. Uh, received. 13 honorary degrees, uh, speaking all over the place, interviews uh, um, daily. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, uh, I, tried, I just did the national one because everybody locally heard of us, you know, that thing. And, uh, and, um, and I uh, picked up a book by C.S. Lewis called Your Christianity, and there's a chapter in there, Pride. It hit me right between the eyes. I couldn't sleep. Uh, basically, he was saying that you don't want more than anybody. you want. You, want, you don't want more. You want more than anybody else. That's what hit me between the eyes. Well, you know, I was I couldn't sleep that night. I was thinking when I was a kid. I I was never a great athlete, but I loved to play. And I, well, and I, you know, I always wanted to make the spectacular play, and I risked my body to do it. And I, well, why did I do that? So if someone say, "Nice play, Tom," or uh, and then I. There was a little trailer of the kids in the, in the old clothes and plowing everything back in the middle. Uh, um, and why did I do that? Uh, because I'm going to sell more pizzas and make more money than anybody else. 
Yeah, no. And I, uh, so I decided that's now I'm going to be. When do you, what year is this? About? About 89. Okay. Well, it's a good thing, too. I think God had a plan because with all this playing around, I got in a lot of other businesses. And Pizza Hut got in the delivery business and literally passed us. And they weren't even in delivery a few years early. Wow. And well, they put a billion dollars in delivery. They just took it away from me. They didn't know what I was doing. If I'm not mistaken, one of the founders of Pizza Hut, though, was a member of Legatus. Yeah. Because I sat next to him. I gave a speech. Oh. In, I gave a speech at Legatus, and I sat right next to him. In uh, Wichita. It, w- it was in Wichita, yeah. And I, I didn't realize because you know, he wasn't talking about it at all. Then I had got done with my speech, and he said, "You know, nice, nice job." And the person sitting next to me said, "He doesn't come to the speakers very often." Do you know who it was? And I didn't know. And I was like, "Wow, really?" But all things great pizza wise are here in Legatus. Yeah, the two largest. Uh, Pizza trains in the world were started by Irish. Yeah. The whole business was Italian. Yeah, wow. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. So, okay, so now the, the pizza is doing well. You're going through this self-examination. You're at the peak of all things. And what? The company what, is going broke. And, uh, I, and uh, I had about a half a billion dollars in debt with about 32 banks with all kinds of entanglement with covenants and everything. And I uh, hired uh, Goldman Sachs come in and uh, keep me away from the bankers so I could put things back together again. And, uh, and the, the price was $8 million. Um, after a couple of months, they met with me and said, uh, this company can't be saved by anybody. In it. We got If it's going to be saved, you got to get a, uh, somebody with a lot of CEO experience. And I said, listen, nobody understands this company better than me. I've turned around before. Uh, if anybody can do it, I can. And it may take a while, but I can do it. And I'm willing to do it. Mm-hmm. And said, well, we don't agree. So uh, uh, we settled on the, give them $5 million, paid them off, which I couldn't afford. And then uh, i say a year, year and a half later, the most profitable year we ever had. Wow. Uh, about two or three And years. that was because you took the helm again and just drove it right back to where you needed to. Yeah, I just focused. I got yep. rid of all I got rid of the tires. I got rid of the whole that's I uh, already started again. I already got rid of the toys. Thank God. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then um, and, uh, oh, that, and the guy uh, was uh, from New York, the guy from Goldman Sachs. He came out to see me and he said, I. So I stopped in and see, and by this time, I think it's 94, we have virtually no debt. We're, uh, we're hoping stores again, their sales is climbing, we're taking over the leadership and the delivery business uh, from Pizza Hut. And, uh, um, and he said, you know, I'm, all my years on Wall Street, i never seen such a complete and dramatic turnaround. Wow. And I said, well, you remember what you told me? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so I mean I'm I'm summarizing this. You reestablish your priorities, you got rid of distractions, and you had laser focus. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. I didn't even read the paper, I didn't watch T V. Um, I just worked. And you just went to work. And yeah. I tell you, uh, I had to settle a lot of lawsuits. Franchisees are suing those slip things, right? Because uh, Yeah, that's a hard that's a hard time when you're going through that sort of thing. Well, the other class action also from franchisees. Wow. And you know, I trust. And I had a $30, $85 million judgment for the damage on a fender bender. On a fender bender? $85 million? It's like the largest uh, pillow of damage in history. General Motors had one larger. What, uh, how, what, how did that even come about? I mean, people are hearing that saying, how, do you, how does somebody get $85 million for a fender bender? It had a lot to do with the... 30 million guarantee and all the uh, publicity about that we're getting from the media that were causing people to drive fast because uh, so the uh, we don't have time or the guarantee. Wow. Wow. And this was a fender bender. Uh, uh, and the, the woman on the other car was a little drug addict. And, uh, and we had insurance. This was a franchisee. They had to have insurance and we had a play cut to cover it. All uh, up to the millions of dollars. It open like well, Nothing like eighty-five million. No. I think people are shocked by that. They, they, you know, that when you are when you run a company, you really understand how the law can really be short on the justice side, and you recognize that it's about 
who can get one over on somebody else. And I think yeah, it was a rather wager. It was uh, yeah, you know, and I, all the pulling on this guy who was running your rush out or oh, yeah. right. forcing you're people. The, you're the speed. you're the least protected species on planet Earth. And it's in Missouri, and the, the Missouri law that uh, insurers can not cover punitive damages. Oh my goodness! Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay, so now you have to recover from all these things while you're rebuilding this. And those are emotional, too. I mean, I just know as a business owner, you know, you, I, you, it's, there's a difference. But if you're saying something about your company, it's a little bit like saying something about your family. I mean, this is something you've poured your heart into and the culture. Okay, so um, now you, uh, you go through that. And uh, what's the distance between that and when you decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to be the most philanthropic guy and I'm going to build something long lasting and real to influence people, which is. Well, that was a lot of what I was doing in the 80s. Mm-hmm. I was, I started the goddess in the 80s. I was, uh, I had a foundation and I was given, I had a, a, a staff that would uh, go through it because I was getting unbelievable number of requests. Yeah. And uh, so I was doing that, and I wanted to do more of that. And, um, then at the uh, late 80s, I put the company up for sale. And that was part of the problem. I stepped aside in the public yeah. car. And uh, so I had to come back in and straighten it out. And make it happen. Yeah. You know, and, and so it, this is the time that you were building churches across the world and helping out with all sorts of different yeah, types of things, yeah, right? The cathedral of Minogue, when we, yeah. The university, Ave Marie University, the law school, Things started initially in Michigan. Then, you know, you, you build an entire town. Uh, walk us through what made you say, this is where I want to put my money. Well, I wanted to help the church uh, uh, in the best way possible. Uh, felt this one, my money, I will scorch it. And, 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 and I want to make sure I, I you know, meet the pearly gate. I, I, I did my due diligence and did what was best. I did a lot of research on what's the best thing I can do for the church and do the most good to save souls. And I narrowed it down to education and communications. So I, I, I want to, this is a, such an a, a important part of, of your story. I want to go back, though, because there's something interesting, I think, for people to understand. You were, you were simultaneously building things like Legatus, uh, you know, a, a great... Uh, organization for Catholic executives to help influence them and to shape and form them and, and have good, you know, fraternity and camaraderie. Um, you were doing all sorts of charitable things. So all of these good things were happening. You were born and raised uh, in this Catholic environment. So you stayed close to God. You were praying your rosaries, going to mass. But you still, though, when you read... C.S. Lewis, you had a deeper conversion. So it's like, I think a lot of people are confused about that. They think people go from being just one way to entirely flipping. You already had your faith in order, but you recognized there was something still there that needed to go further. Did that accelerate? Yeah, well, what I was doing was walking the tightrope. Okay. Yeah, you know, I guess what I really wanted to be was a billionaire and see. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to be both. And I, uh, and I, I didn't really want to... I justified all the toys. You know, airplanes, you can justify time as money. I use the yachts for and sailors for, for franchisees and the lodge up north. And I had a justification. I'm good at Yeah, don't tell me there's anything wrong with airplanes. Not quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. that's, the thing I, that's the thing I miss the most. Yeah. Uh, especially with the security and everything. And I started uh, skipping more and more money to the church. I had, um, uh, before the crash, I... I built the cathedral in Malawi. It was common in this country then. I uh, started the first Catholic radio station in the United States. Yes. And then I sp- uh, financed people to build more, and then I provide all the programming. We're still doing the programming today. We're, we provide free programming per over 300 and some Catholic radio stations. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I started the Sisters of Mary, Mother Eucharist. I built my mother house and, and some schools. And some private Catholic schools, and I helped with their uh, build a new uh, high school for a uh, Catholic high school in Ann Arbor. I was doing things like that. Um, 
And so I'm starting to do that again in the, in the, in the 90s after things are getting better. And the bank called and said, you can't give more than 10% of your profits to charity. Or, um, but that was becoming meaningless because I think when they sold the company up $44 million in debt, like I'll pay that off immediately, mm-hmm. pay the cash. Uh, but uh, I wanted to, well, I started the school uh, in a very humble school in Ipsland. And my background was in higher education was Franciscan and Christian and my then board of both those, two, probably the two most spiritual schools in the country, TAC and my pay the other one. Yeah. And, um, and um, I found out that uh, Franciscan, a lot of these other schools, we on the board didn't control the most important thing, like who's the president. Mm. They, they, they get away from their order, and apparently their order wasn't as orthodox as the guy that made the school, Father Mike Scandal. Mm. So it weren't for that, I, I was the biggest donor at Franciscan. It weren't for that, I'd probably given them hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm. Well, so I st- started my own. Wow. The, board, the you... board controls it. The board, I have, I'm just one shareholder. Yeah. Uh, I'm shareholder for life, mm-hmm. but I'm only one shareholder. Not one shareholder, one board member. One board member, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, okay, so you have this, y- 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 this understanding that if you're going to really impact the church, you're going to form minds and future and leaders and souls, yes. And so you start a law school, you start the university, which now has an incredible number of, of majors. Um, and how, what, what took you from Michigan to Florida in doing that? And how did you decide to go from just simply having a university to building a town, Ave Maria town and Ave Maria University? I mean, this is not small thinking. Well, it wasn't necessarily planned. Uh, I, I was uh, I had the land uh, in Ann Arbor to build a university, uh, 2,300 acres, uh, but I couldn't get zoning. A small township in the and they just no no growth. And so meanwhile, we had a, a temporary campus in Ypsilanti, which is near Ann Arbor, and a little uh, elementary school we bought and bought a bunch of apartments and houses around because we wanted our kids to live in campus. But we were personally at seams, and we're still without first space, and so. I was panicking. I'm praying there lately. I said, what am I going to do? And I was saying, really, why am I doing this in Ann Arbor? Huh. Where's the best place in the country to build a Catholic school? Mm-hmm. And I know the map of the United States well, as well as anybody. And it was Naples. Um, there was only eight schools south of Mason Dixon Lane that were Catholic. Wow. And all of them were significant. Ninety percent of the schools were Catholic where it's cold in the wintertime. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, yeah, the, the Florida's the uh, you know, beautiful, fastest growing large state in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, it's number two now. Yeah. Uh, no, number three. Uh, California and Texas past New York. Yeah. Did you know that Leading Giants has over 120 micro learning modules from four to 19 minutes on entrepreneurship, communication, anything to maximize your influence. We are here to help you build the life of your dreams by maximizing your influence, growing a company, leading people at levels you've never led before. If you're in sales, having a greater opportunity for increased closing percentages and larger activity than you've ever had before. It's time now for you to jump in and join Leading Giants. All I have to do is press that button right down there. In order to access this, share with your friends, become a giant. We'll go slay some dragons. So that's why we moved there. And we were, we had a option on that on the four sections of land on the edge of Naples, $120 million. And, uh, and, and, and then we, now, we made the announcement at the press conference. Until we got a call from uh, a family that used to own the whole county. They had uh, just under 11,000 acres further out. I turned it down, and they kept pressing me on my people to, to, to take the free lands to, to spend $120 million. Uh, I, uh, I finally came in, and I shouldn't have done it, but that's that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, they wanted to use our university as a nucleus to build a town, to all the infrastructure and everything. And they said, well, uh, if, if the university is going to be the, 
the reason the town thrives, then we want to own half of the town, too. Mm -hmm. We want to buy the agricultural prices and there. So we own half the town. Wow. And so um, it's flourished. It's been amazing. It's gone through ups and downs, I realize. We opened it when the crash came. Yes. I, I, uh, so walk through that. So there's two questions that I do want to ask you be before our time is up, and I want to be respectful of that. And one is kind of related uh, to what you just said with the crash. Let's go to the first one, and then we'll come back. And I'll tell you what the second one is. The second one is when, when, when things were troubled, you know, how did you, how did you get through that? But before that, if, if the today Tom Monahan were to go back and talk to the 20 year old Tom Monahan, and you would have known now, or you would have known then what you know now, are there any like big moments that you would say, Hey, listen, you're 20. I've, I've lived for 66 years longer than you have. I know what's coming. Here's what I wish I'd have known when I was 20. Is there anything that stands out? Many things. Many things. Many things. A lot of mistakes. First one was uh, as soon as I got the business successful, within a year, I took out a partner. It was the most lopsided partnership in the history of American business. I thought I'd write a book about it. It's so absurd. Wow. What I'd put up with, uh, and I wouldn't even go into it, but uh, uh, and then um, and it took me three, three years of still in the business blind and then having to pay him a lot of money to get it back. And I borrowed from suppliers. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and, and he paid $500 for half the business. It was probably worth about thirty, forty thousand. 40000 But I wanted his expertise. I, I was a young kid, and he had been experienced in business before. Uh, he went bankrupt, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so... It was three years of him living like a king, and me living in a little trailer with a couple of kids, working seven days a week, uh, no days off, uh, and, uh, and just keeping the thing alive. And we still in the place playing. Wow. And, uh, so eventually he um, offered to split it up. And, uh, but I had to give him $35,000. <laughs> oh my goodness! We had all these bills. The bills one. So was he out entirely at that point? No, we had, we had some other stores. We had some restaurants that we bought and little down because he didn't think there was any potential in the piece of this. That was really really those two because he was gone all the time. Oh, well, he was older, and um, and so he took the restaurants and I took the pizza places. Wow. And he, um, and all the money was in the restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, and then a year later. Uh, I had to take over the one of the restaurants. They made in their fourth pizza place uh, because he his bills were piling up again. About a year after that, he went bankrupt. Uh, he'd been, been bankrupt before, and he right to the day. It's like seven years since the last time. You should write that book. You should write like five things I learned about bad partnerships. There's a lot of people in them, and they would they would probably. Uh, gain something from that, that uh, I'd get the pen working on that one for sure. Uh, anything else that stands out that you would have? Well, uh, I was uh, doing a movie on John Paul II. Oh, yeah. So I got involved with band attorney and brought in a producer. It was, it was a problem. Uh, but I put about $5 million into it. Well, no, I got a script. Uh, well, the way it will ask me to stop it. And it got permission from and Paul II to do it. And, uh, but uh, fairly, there were some issues with delicate discussion between Rome and Moscow. And, uh, and, uh, and it, was, it was very clear that the guy that assassinated, tried to assassinate the Pope was, was a Russian uh, a source. Uh -huh. So that was in the movie. And so I had to stop it, and I was ready to anyhow because. This producer was attorney. Uh, so I got sued. And, uh, and they picked right up in the street journal they, about me and glad I left my contract. We never had a contract. Well, I tried to get them to explain some of the things that was in that, in that uh, clause to that movie that I, they couldn't explain. Turned out it was attorney at a, at a like $750,000 number in there for associate directors. 
Which was his brother or something, probably, huh? Well, they were friends. Yeah. So uh, about that time, in the middle of this, I got a call from Mel Gibson. He wanted me to support the fun, help him with this movie. Yes. Well, this little movie called The Passion? Yeah, for $7 million, I could have won 35 percent. Oh, my goodness. Oh. <laughs> and I turned it down because I was having this bad bad day on a previous movie i mean what that would would have turned out to be probably something in the ballpark of like 300 million or something oh yeah easy easy it keeps coming wow well that's unbelievable so okay just for my part yeah just for your yeah right just for your portion of that um so we only have a few minutes left um i think the the two things one would be you've overcome a lot you've dealt with uh you know everybody thinks uh from the outside, they look and they go, it's easy. He came up with a great pizza idea and he made billions and everything went great. But you're talking about having to save the company. You're talking about lawsuits. You're talking about radically unfair things like an $85 million bumper or a fender bender, uh, all of these challenges that come away. Um, what w- w- is there like a, a common formula that you used when things kind of hit the fan that you said, this is how I'm going to get past this? Oh, well, I have my faith. Hell on. And, uh, and I knew that uh, even if I went bankrupt, I wasn't going to do it. Three, three creditors put me in bankruptcy. And I, I had faced that for many years. I thought it could happen any day. And, uh, but I, I wasn't going to worry about that because I'm not going to do it. Two words I don't like, bankruptcy and divorce. And uh, uh, maybe murder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so I just, uh, and somehow or other, thank God, I... Uh, I, I was able to bounce back. I never stayed down very long. Uh, and I, and I always wanted to take the long road. And, and, uh, I remember when I was living in a trailer and I, uh, well, I was bemoaning the fact that this partner was taking me to the cleaners and working like nobody works. And uh, I had him in, in nowhere. And uh, I thought, well, I'm not worried about as long as I'm working, doing half the work and I'm not stealing for the billets. I've got nothing to worry about. Well, some way, somehow, it'll work. Yeah, clean conscious and just get the job done. I was at the, what is it called? The um, the mass for the seniors before they graduate um, at the university. Baccalaureate. Yes. And you gave what, if it wouldn't have been in a church, would have been considered a, like a commencement speech. And it was one of the best speeches I've ever heard. Do you remember what you said? Um, so... President Mindorf asked you to speak, and I'm going to try to summarize your words, and you can tell me where that's right. But he said something like, there are three things that I want you to do. Do you remember this now? Oh. Okay. The big three. The big three. So you have this opportunity to give a very long, flowing speech. It ended up being about 60 seconds. Can you encapsulate it? Well, I said, well, uh, well, what I'll do is I'll give the uh, first one. That was at Stubbenville. Okay. Well, that was when they received an honorary degree. And okay, so this was actually a commencement speech. Yes, and I okay. uh, repeated it. Yeah. And, uh, and I worked real hard on that speech because uh, that was, I really thought a lot of Stubbenville, they were Franciscan. And I'm, and I'm walking into the gym for their commencement. And I got my notes there, which I worked over and worked over for months. And I just look at it and I just, oh, this is terrible. I can't do this. And so I went over in a quarter of the gym, which I paid for, by the way. The gym? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I just prayed the Holy Spirit for help. I need help. What am I going to do here? And I had to follow Mary Beth Dumucci. Yeah. Yeah. It was a yeah, spell vibe. Spark plug. Yeah. And um, the, the, so all of a sudden, uh, I got an idea. And... Um, the word public address, they say, uh, Mr. Miley, I'm here while on the stage. So I went up there, calm as a cucumber, my turn came up, and, uh, and I said, uh, uh, there's about 4,000 schools in the country, and, uh, and they all have a commencement speech, and they're, they're all good and worth listening to, but mine's better than any of them. In fact, it's not a speech, it's a, it's a challenge. They challenge anyone, all you graduates, uh, for the rest of your life, say a rosary every day. And I couldn't believe it. Yay! Oh, and you're the son. Yay! They're cheering, yeah. And then uh, the 
calm down. That's how you tell them everyone to say a rosary every day. <laughs> then uh, then uh, they calmed down. They said that a child would go to the confession at least once a month for the rest of life. Yeah. Then I said, and if I have to explain why that's important, you waste four years here. Thank you very much. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. And you said the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. That, and there's, there's the, the big three, daily rosary, monthly confession, and daily mass. And that's like the greatest way to wrap up this interview. I mean, it's like, all of that, here you have Mr. Tom Monahan, this iconic figure. Tell us about graduating from, from university to go become something great. Is it going to be this strategic business idea? Is it going to be this great investment here? Nope. It's you get right with God. And that's, that's what you've done. So I'm really grateful that you uh, took the time out today. And I know there's a lot of people who would be edified by this. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Hey there, Giant. Thanks for watching Durand On Demand. I need your help with something. The world desperately needs more Giants. You know it, and I know it. We've been around a lot of people struggling, figuring out how to make things go. So hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, share this with as many people as you can. We're going to build this audience, and we're going to help people slay dragons together.